Before I became an evoker, I was just your average villager with an interest in magic. I was treated as an outcast by the others and eventually they couldn't handle how powerful I was becoming, so I was banished from the village. I found my way to this swamp and met a witch who gave me a potion that she said would fix everything, but when I would wake up the next morning, that would not be the case. This turmoil gave rise to three goals that I gave myself 100 days to complete. Number one, take over and transform a woodland mansion where no one else would bother me. Number two, raise up an army to destroy my home village. And number three, exact revenge on the witch who turned me into this monster. My first day as an evoker, I noticed the witch and all of her belongings were gone. Then I noticed I had two extra hearts and I didn't understand why the witch would make me a more powerful enemy. I also wasn't used to punching down swamp trees. Once I had some basic tools, I went around killing all the animals I could find. I also grabbed as much sugar cane as I could find because I would need that very soon. And once I had plenty of food, it was about to get dark and I wanted to go mining. That night, I noticed a light coming from a cave and when I went to go investigate, I found this chest. Upon opening it, I found this video sponsor, Dragon City, which is a free to play game that you can easily download using the first link in the description. In this game, you can collect and train over a thousand different dragons and you know how much I love to build in Minecraft, so one of my favorite features is that you can build your very own Dragon City. Don't worry, it's available to play on a lot of different platforms. You can play this free game on Android, iOS, Windows, and even Amazon. Once you get started and have a few dragons, you can actually breed them together to get new ones and feed them to evolve. As you train your dragons, they'll become more and more powerful with every battle. You want to make sure your dragons are nice and strong for the different PvP modes Dragon City has to offer. You can invite and battle your friends to see who is the better trainer, as well as challenge other dragon masters. There are plenty of events you can discover every week, and you have the chance of finding many of your favorite YouTubers like Dream, George Not Found, and several others in game. Make sure you use the link in my description below. If you use that link, you can get some free rewards including 15,000 food, 30,000 gold, and the very rare Citadel Dragon. That will be sure to give you a nice head start to the new dragon-filled adventure that awaits you. Here's something that's really important. This offer is only available for new users and for only the next 7 days until July 30th, so make sure you claim those rewards before you miss out. Now let's get back to adventuring. I continued to search for another cave filled with resources and got some coal. Then I set my food to cook while I got my first bit of iron, as well as grabbed some more coal. Then I nearly had a heart attack when I turned around and I was face to face with the creeper. I forgot I was also a hostile mob. I spent the next few days searching through this cave system and wanted to collect some more coal, iron, and redstone for mostly mischievous deeds. But I also did need armor and compasses to trade. And while I was collecting more redstone, I saw the glisten of diamonds. I wish I was always this lucky in Minecraft. I did nearly fall into lava, but as I mined it, I realized I had stumbled upon an eight vein of diamonds. Day five, I came out of the caves and I began searching for a village. I actually managed to find one without having to travel too far. I came across what looked like a start of a forest fire. I tried to put it out but gave up really quickly. I needed to get a map so I could find a woodland mansion a lot more easily. And as I approached the village, I almost fell into another ravine. Yep, that would have definitely hurt. I spent the rest of that night pillaging the village and I lazily looked through the windows for loot in some of the houses. And this is where my luck ran out. Not a single house had a chest. But I did get this potion brew stand at least. The next morning, I trapped as many villagers as I could. That way they'd be all in one place for me to trade with. Then I took a little bit of time to get their workstations ready. I used the sugar cane that I had to make a cartography table. I turned the gravel I got mining into flint to make fletching tables, as well as made a few composters. Now I could sell sticks and wheat for emeralds and spend those emeralds on the cartographer to get a map to a woodland mansion. <laughs> but unfortunately, I didn't have a lot of wood on me. So on day seven, I crafted up myself a diamond axe and continued to chop down trees to get as many sticks as I could. As the sun began to rise on day 10, my axe got the last good use out of it, and I actually made my way pretty far from the village and stumbled upon another village. So I took all of their wheat, traded it with the local farmer, and headed back to the first village where all my villagers were. It wasn't actually too far away, so I decided to grab all the copper I got from mining, crafted up as many lightning rods as I could, and went back to the village I just looted, then began putting copper rods on their roofs to attract lightning in case they ever have a thunderstorm. See, pillagers would just outright kill and burn everything. Evokers, on the other hand, are a little more subtle, <laughs> yet a lot more crazy. Unfortunately, the fun was interrupted by these sky rats. So after a little bit of time of trying to fight them off, I just decided to go to bed. As the sun began to rise on day 11, I returned back to my prisoners again, collected all of the wheat that they had there, and I actually got myself a good amount of emeralds from a farmer who managed to evade capture. That's when I realized I should probably stock up on food since I was going to be here a little while longer. I took some time to kill all of the village's livestock, as well as all the peaceful woodland animals in the surrounding area. 
I didn't want to waste any wheat on bread because I knew that I would need every emerald I could get. Also, I was a little sick of eating wheat. On day 12, I set my food to cook and grabbed this melted iron and gold that I left in the furnace while I was chopping down trees. I actually had enough gold to craft up some golden apples. And since I was about out of wheat, I switched out the composters with fletching tables and spent the next three days trading away with all the villagers. These few days went by pretty quickly because I had to sleep through the nights because villagers aren't open 24 seven anymore. Then on day 15, I was finally able to buy a Woodland Mansion map. But before I decided to go, just to be nice, I wanted to leave all my new prisoners with a way to escape. I found a nearby cave, got a bucket of lava, and arrived back to the villagers with a dispenser in hand. I placed it down through the lava inside and replaced the block with a pressure plate so the villagers could escape. However, whoever tries to leave first would make the lava pour onto all of their friends. And I guess he couldn't live with that guilt. On day 16, it was time to set out to find my brand new home, but it turned out the mansion was a lot farther than I had hoped. I think it ended up being over 10,000 blocks away. I had to travel through many different biomes, as well as brave a storm or two, but on day 19, I finally arrived to the mansion and took this day to look through all the rooms for any loot, but that's when I remembered I had a full inventory. Once I found myself a good room to claim as my own, I dropped my stuff off and went back to looting. The mansion actually had a lot of cool things, including both a melon and pumpkin farm. I also found other people like me, who after talking to them, unfortunately came across that orange witch as well. They really did not want to talk to me about it. For whatever reason, this part of the mansion did not have an entrance, so I had to cut my way in, and had to go through all this extra work to get to a small third floor where all they had up here was two giant chickens. On day 20, now that I had found a place to settle down and unloaded all my inventory, I made a diamond pickaxe and some torches and went outside to find a good place to mine. But then I figured it would be actually cooler and easier to just have a mine under my new mansion. I was pretty glad I dug there because I stumbled upon a mine shaft. I found some more gold and my first bit of lapis. I almost broke this spider spawner because I hate cave spiders, but I didn't just in case I wanted to build a spider farm with it. This mine shaft was pretty expansive. Unfortunately, I wasn't as lucky as I initially thought because I couldn't find any chests, but the exploration was more than worth it when I found this cute little axolotl swimming around. I crafted up a bucket with some of the iron I had mined, grabbed some nearby water, and caught this cute little guy. On day 21, I worked my way back to where I came from and continue mining down to diamond level. I was determined to get enough diamonds for at least full diamond armor all in one go. I normally continue mining with a full inventory to get as many diamonds as I can in the least amount of time and only sometimes storing stuff in chests down in my mine. But I knew that I needed a ton of cobblestone to transform the mansion. So I had to keep making trips back up to the surface. Also, now that deep slate is in the game, it really slows you down a bit because they take twice as long to break. I eventually broke my pickaxe and had to make a new one. And once I got just a few more diamonds, I headed back up to the surface. I think I had mined about 29 diamonds altogether, which was more than enough for a full set of diamond armor. On day 28, I noticed my rations were dwindling, and since I had a big pond right at my front door, I decided to spend that day fishing for some more food. Day 29 and 30, I spent gathering some more dark oak wood to also use to transform the mansion. On day 31, I thought I had the biggest brain idea ever. Here it is. Since you can't mine a bookshelf without silk touch, I figured I could use a single sticky piston with a lever to move some bookshelves around in that library I found earlier. That way I could easily surround an enchanting table without having to craft a single bookshelf. I had everything that I needed to make a piston, I just needed a little bit of slime. So I headed back to that big swamp that I remembered passing through while searching for the mansion. While there, I found another witch hut, but the witch there was no friend of that orange witch. Then she actually offered her help when I mentioned my old village. After that conversation, I spent the night of day 31 killing slime. And quick note, I don't think axolotls will attack slime, although they do look pretty cool in a swamp. When the sun rose on day 32, I headed back to my mansion to test my big brain theory. Day 33, I spent moving around these bookshelves until I had at least 15 surrounding a block where I could put an enchanting table down. Then I needed to actually craft an enchanting table. So I headed back down into my mine and got just enough obsidian to craft an enchanting table and to build a nether portal. So I had the obsidian and I had the diamonds. I just needed one book. I went to go break a bookshelf and it dropped three books. Here's where my theory began to break down. I thought I was lucky the first time, but every bookshelf dropped three books. So all I had to do was break 15 bookshelves, use less than two stacks of wooden planks, and I could have saved myself three whole days of work. <laughs> Let me know how you normally get bookshelves in the comments. I spent day 34 trimming off the bottom part of the roof all the way around the mansion. I quickly learned that I would need a water bucket in my offhand, which definitely saved me more than once. And while I was hard at work, the witch that turned me into an evoker peered at me through the trees below. I 
I jumped down and began chasing her, but as she ran deeper into the forest, I quickly lost her. So I turned back around and headed back toward the mansion. Day 35, I was back to work and added some extra fortification to the walls to better support my new roof. <laughs> While I was transforming the mansion, I ran out of food and had to grab all the fish that I caught that I forgot that I left in the furnace. Also, these pillagers wanted to talk to me for some reason, and I was a little too busy to talk at that moment, but I would visit them later on. And by day 40, the mansion was starting to look much more fortified and intimidating. I added a lot of cobblestone as well as watchtowers to all the corners of the roof, along with a slightly wider watchtower right above the main entrance to make it easier to find. And my favorite part was the third story additions. I wanted to expand that roof to make it a perfect rectangle, so I added some pillars to hold it up. I really forgot how expansive mansions can be. On day 41, I tried to better map out the mansion to make it a little easier to navigate, and I added this new way to access the roof. I figured out that by adding a doorway here, I would have direct access to my enchanting table room, plus I could take the stairs up and they could lead me right to the roof. And the next morning, I decided to embrace the fact that there were random builds inside of the mansions, so I used this chicken as a way to the top of my base. Also, this might be my first time ever using diorite in a build. And want to know the best part? Matching chickens means matching ways up and down. Yeah, this is one instance where having giant windows probably is not a good thing, but they normally are pretty good to have, especially when it helps you find another hidden room. If you ever find this in a mansion, make sure to check inside. Have you ever heard of the goose that lays golden eggs? Well, this is much better. Diamonds. Another thing I learned about being an evoker, vindicators make terrible roommates. They never sleep and it's just a constant stream of argumentative grunts. They also have no sense of personal space. Plus, they invite friends over who don't have the best reputations. On day 43, I began searching for a desert temple to hopefully find a saddle and make traveling a lot easier. I eventually found a desert and was fortunate to see a temple in the distance. I of course wanted the TNT, but there was no saddle. Although it's hard to complain about not getting a saddle with finding diamond horse armor, an enchanted golden apple, and a silk touch book, which I could have used like 10 days ago. Also, in my travels, I found this village, but they didn't have the building that would have had a saddle. Fortunately, they did have a zombie horde rampaging through the night. So being the evil gentleman I was, I proceeded to chop down all the doors in the village. It was kind of like when the lid to a jar of food is stuck so you get a friend to help you open it. And then I took all of their wheat and climbed the tower to see what was all around. And that's when I saw another desert temple sticking out of the ground. I felt like living life on the edge, so I jumped off the tower and MLG landed on a nearby building. Then I also water bucketed into the temple. I felt brave, but I was not gonna be dumb, so I mined down to the loot. I did not want to risk setting off the 19 T that would await my timely arrival. And this is where I found not one, but two saddles. The next morning, I found a horse and headed back to my mansion. On day 47, it was time for another trip. With the empty maps I got from the cartographer, who fell in lava or something, in hand, I headed back to my horse and began traveling back to my home village. <laughs> this trip was much easier on horseback. This time, I went for two reasons. Number one, to scout it out before the attack. So I chose to stop in a cave on the way and went searching for everything I'd need to make a spyglass. And the second reason was to map out the area to give to the army I was about to band together. That way, they could all meet me there and we could all raid the village together. I tested out a spyglass on a nearby goat and then began checking out the village's defenses. Since I was last there, it looked like they hired a wandering hero who brought a lot of strong help with him. Exacting revenge on my hometown was gonna be a little harder than I expected. Once I got what I came for, I headed back to the mansion. I spent day 51 and 52 building some bridges at the entrance of my mansion, leading in all directions. And to the right is a really crowded forest, so I made a staircase so I could easily stride amongst the treetops. I also added one more important feature, a little home for my horse. I tried my best to keep it looking like a vanilla style build, and it was pretty refreshing to build with cobblestone because it's so easy to get. With the entrance complete and my woodland mansion transformed, my first goal was finished and it was time to start planning out the attack on my home village. On day 53, I began hunting down some more food on my way to a nearby village, and while I was at the village, I saw the witch again, but she quickly vanished. I wanted to set up a trading system to get some better enchanted books, so I captured two villagers, and I wish I had a plethora of iron to minecart their way to captivity, <laughs> but I had to make do with some boats. When we finally did make it back to the mansion, I set up this villager breeder, and now my fort could have some proper prisoners for me to trade with. On day 56, I finally remembered to enchant some of my gear. Then I built a portal to the nether and went in search for a fortress. And I spent day 58 collecting blaze rods for potions. By the end of day 59, I made it back to my portal and was back in the overworld. On day 60, I began brewing some potions and captured some new test subjects to practice my magic on. I caught this little chicken, a small creature, a pig, a somewhat mini 
medium-sized creature, and a cow, one of the bigger creatures to roam the nearby lands. I honestly didn't know the extent of my magic powers or what my potions would do, and after I threw the magical potions upon these helpless animals, I slept soundly through the night. I woke up the next morning and collected some iron to add some lanterns around my build, and when I went to go check on my test subjects, the chicken transformed into this weird ghost thing that really seemed to like me. I think I'll call it a vex. <laughs> the pig was just a violent deformed mess, and the cow was missing? And there was a huge hole in the wall. I soon found what I created and it chased me around the mansion until he backed me into a corner. It doesn't look too big in this giant mansion, but when it's right in your face, it's absolutely terrifying. So I started throwing random things to it and it seemed to have a taste for wood and iron. This ravenous creature would be perfect to attack the village with. I decided to call it a ravager. <laughs> the next day, I took some time to capture some more cows and turn them into ravengers and I made a more potent potion so there was an instant change, <laughs> which was a little unfortunate for the vindicator who got stuck inside with them. Then I tried making a potion to make the creatures a bit smarter to have a better tactical advantage. I found the first ravenger I made chasing the vex around the room, so I threw potions at both of them and even I was surprised by the results. Why did you turn us into these creatures? I think it's kind of nice actually. Well, at least you can fly. You look like you could easily destroy anything in your path. I am feeling pretty strong. And I did knock down that wall earlier pretty easily. I wasn't expecting them to become smart enough to talk. That part made kind of sense, but I honestly don't know what caused them to get those accents. But the three of us were quickly becoming friends. And now it was time to prepare to fight. We all had to hone our skills before the battle. In fact, I think this is the perfect time for an inspirational training montage. Let's cue the music. By the end of day 65, we were all ready to battle. Day 66, I gave some maps to my vindicators, told them to stop by the swamp and recruit the witches on the way to the village, as well as bring the ravengers along with them. I also made them have an encampment set up before I arrived. My army was almost complete. If I wanted to win this battle, I knew that I would need to recruit the pillagers for help. I found the biggest pillager outpost I had ever seen and asked the guards at the entrance if I could talk to the chieftain. I was definitely not too welcomed here, and this pillager said if I wanted help, I'd need to fight the chieftain, who came out of the pillager tower and said that I would have to fight him for leadership over the pillagers. We went out the gate of the outpost, he placed down his flag, and said that I would have to duel him to the death if I wanted to lead his soldiers into battle. We began circling each other, and soon the duel commenced. Luckily, I had my vex with me, and we continued to battle the chieftain together. Finally, after a grueling duel, I became the victor and the new pillager chieftain. So I picked up the banner and brought it before the pillagers. They said that they would fight by my side and destroy the village with me. On day 68, the Vex and I met back up with our Ravager friend and began traveling to the village. <laughs> Ravagers are definitely not meant to travel long distances. <laughs> they are much more deadly sprinting short distances, and there's nothing quite like watching a wizard ride a white horse along the countryside. On the night of day 69, we arrived back to the village and spotted the Vindicator's camp up on the mountain. We made our way up, I parked my horse outside, and took command of the operation. Later into the night, all my reinforcements began to arrive. The Pillagers got there first and they were itching for a fight. Then the witches got there and had plenty of potions to throw at the villagers and to my surprise even the other evokers came to fight. I knew that the battle in the morning would be epic. As the sun began to dawn on day 70, I rallied my troops as we prepared to launch our attack. I jumped down into the water and as the first wave moved into the village, all the villagers began to panic. I quite literally fanned the flames of the battle by lighting houses on fire as the golem and hero attempted to fight off my pillager troops. Iron golems began close Closing in on me, the fire was spreading, and I could hear the sound of Ravager footsteps behind me. It was pure chaos, and I loved every second of it. The wandering hero was a formidable foe. I watched as he chopped down a fellow evoker, and then got chased off by a swarm of vexes. And that wasn't the only thing that chased him down. Eventually, my forces were too overwhelming for one valiant knight to handle, and we managed to kill the wandering hero. And that's the story of the very first raid in Minecraft. After that battle, wandering heroes were disgraced, and had 
had to turn to trading just to get by. But the story doesn't end there. We still have one more goal to accomplish, so we headed on home. Through a lot of trial and error and chasing down escapees, I managed to get these villagers into place to sell me some books. But I didn't have much emeralds, so I made myself a diamond pickaxe and spent the next few days collecting wood to turn into emeralds. On day 79, I turned these villagers into Fletchers and got plenty of emeralds from them and sold all the wheat that I had to the farmer in charge of making more villagers. I started to head up to my library when I noticed an iron golem had spawned, <laughs> the one set back to having villagers as prisoners. Once I got to my library, I went to the back and broke down some bookshelves so I could use the books to buy enchanted books. Then I spent way too long repeating this process and trying to get the right enchanted books to trade from the villagers, as well as selling all the sticks that I had. But eventually I had a full room of villagers and a lot of good enchantments. I knew that all the effort would pay off when I faced the witch. Next, I looked around the mansion for this room with an anvil, and the first thing I did was get the Bane of Arthropods off my sword. Then I proceeded to make my sword OP, and I saw I was quickly running out of levels, so I decided to upgrade the rest of my gear a little bit. And since I needed more levels, what better way than mining quartz? And there's a cat in the nether. You know, maybe having villagers in the mansion wasn't the best idea. Soon enough, I had some really well enchanted armor, and it was just in time too. On day 93, an evoker came to tell me he spotted the orange witch on horseback galloping across the treetops. Time to get my revenge. Good luck! Wait, I'm coming with you! Sure enough, we found the witch on top of nearby trees and the chase began. This could only happen in Minecraft. The witch led me through different biomes and I managed to keep up with her for two full days. And my little Vex buddy stuck close by my side the whole time. I was so focused on killing the witch, I was not watching where I was going. And I rode my horse right into a cave. But I was okay and kept up the pursuit. As the dawn of day 95 began to break on the horizon, the witch ditched her horse and jumped down a hole in the ground lit up by Enrod. We followed her down and ended up in a stronghold. Then we tried our best to chase her through this labyrinth. I definitely enjoyed the horse chase more than this part. Day 96, we found the witch waiting for us in the portal room with the portal already lit, and she jumped through. As we approached the center of the main end island, the witch awaited us with an end crystal in hand. She placed it down and we were a bit stunned as the pillars began to regenerate. We chased her to the gateway, but she managed to escape our grasp. It didn't feel right leaving the dragon behind to rule, so so it was time for a fight. I gave a bow to my Vex and had him take out all the towers. Then it was time to take down the dragon's health, which was fairly challenging. And when it came down to the last second, my Vex flew straight into the dragon, sacrificing himself to save me. It was a bittersweet victory. I spent the next two days searching through the end dimension for the witch and headed east because that was really the only way I could go. And on day 99, I found this end city and followed this endstone bridge to the ship. I ran past these endermen and was greeted with a potion to the face. She had nowhere to run and I hit her off into the void. But it felt off. Like it was too easy. I killed the one who turned me into an evoker, but I lost a friend in the process. I made my way to a gateway and jumped through the portal and found my ravenger friend on the roof <laughs> with a makeshift hay bed. And I told him everything that happened. But after he asked me how a ghost could die, I focused all my magic together and respawned my vex. A happy ending. <laughs> well, at least for me, maybe not the villagers. And that's why I survived 100 days as an evoker in hardcore Minecraft. Thanks to Luke the Notable for starting the 100 days trend, to Lockdown Life and Gamers for helping me make this video, and I want to give a special thanks to Dragon City for sponsoring this video. Remember to use the link in the description to get their free game plus the bonus food, gold, and dragon. I'm sure you'll have a ton of fun. Also, thanks to my patrons for your continued support, and you for watching this video. If you enjoyed, please like and subscribe, it really helps, and check out all the links in my description. Thanks again for watching.